Good afternoon, Sarah Earnshaw. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to St Matthew's Wednesday q and It's great to have you in the hot seat this week via Zoom. <laughs> it's good to be here, thank you. So, um, Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, so, um, uh, my name's Sarah, I live in Blackburn. Um, quite well, close off for that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I shouldn't have offered that, should I? Um, quite close to Junction 4 of the motorway, which is always handy when I'm whizzing up and down uh, to visit various people uh, across the diocese. Um, I'm married to Ken, who's a postman, and I've got two boys. So I've got Max, who's 10, uh, who'll be off to high school, hopefully in September, and uh, Elijah, who's 6. I cannot believe that Max is 10. I know. That makes me feel really old. <laughs> Nearly taller than me as well, which is great. Wow. <laughs> um, so, Sarah, you are a Christian. And, I am. Um, I wonder if you could just tell us a tiny bit about what your journey of faith has been like. Did, did you have faith as a child? Was that something you grew up with? Um, I kind of grew up going to church, really. Um, and it was a church that had quite thriving children and youth work at the time. So I guess I've always been um, familiar with like the well-known Bible stories, but then perhaps similar to a lot of people, um, as I became a teenager and got a bit older, I kind of drifted away from church. Um, my friends kind of took priority at the time. And then as I got a little bit older, still I got a part-time job, which meant I often worked on a Sunday. So I kind of stopped going to church really. And it was never a conscious decision. I just kind of drifted away. But then um, when I was 20, uh, I met, my husband, who is our husband, and we kind of fell in love. Um, and we made the decision that we wanted to get married in church. Um, so we kind of had two options. It was like my uh, husband's um, parish church, which was a really beautiful, pretty church. Uh, and then the church that my parents attended, which was the most ugly building you've ever seen in your life. So of course, we were attracted to the pretty looking church. Uh, but after going a few times on a Sunday morning, we did kind of feel that we were made to be welcome or kind of slotted into that congregation. So we then tried my parents' church uh, and the vicar at the time was um, brilliant in terms of relational ministry. Uh, he really drew us into the church family and um, we ended up doing an alpha course and ended up becoming Christians through that really. So I was probably about I think, 21 when I became a Christian. Um, and then we started attending a uh, house group and um, it, was, it was brilliant actually for me that because I was really encouraged by hearing other people asking questions um, that I was fearful of asking myself because I thought they would be too silly. Um, but because other people were asking those questions and we're in that environment where people were uh, of all ages were exploring faith together, um, then that really developed me in my faith um, and, and kind of it's just grown from there really. And we've been at that same church uh, ever since and um, really feel part of that church community. Fantastic. That's uh, really good to hear and I definitely agree with that kind of having a group where people can ask any kind of questions and it, it builds your confidence a little bit doesn't it especially when you think oh I don't know if it's okay to ask that and somebody yeah. else asks it. <laughs> it's really good. So uh, we've had lots of different um, questions sent in for today which is fantastic and one of them is what made you go into children's work because you are the diocesan children's work advisor so when did you first get involved in children's work? So as I say we kind of um, me and my husband became part of the church community um, and as well as being really good at relational ministry uh, the vicar there was pretty good uh, at discerning people's gifts um, so after we became Christians and we've been at the church for a while um, the vicar encouraged us, me and my husband, to take over the preschool, Sunday school group, um, which was really scary. It was something that we had to spend some time praying about because neither of us had any real experience of working with children and especially small children. Um, but we prayed about it and felt that God was saying, yeah, I think this is what you should be doing. So, um, so we started doing that. We just took over and we really loved it. And because we were blessed by doing that work so much. Uh, I then did lots of training and went to as many events as I possibly could um, to try and pick up new skills and get ideas so that um, I, could, I could just run that group in the best way I, I was able to really. Um, and then looking, at, looking back at that, um, I can just see how um, God has kind of called me through various roles in terms of children's work volunteering in church. Um, and that has kind of led me on a journey to where I am now really. So. Yeah, 
that's how it all began. <laughs> little steps to start with, really, and then it's yeah. become your full time your full time ministry, which is yeah, great. absolutely yeah. Great. Um, so I've just said that you are the Darson Children's Work Advisor. Um, mm. Now I used to work for the diocese, and I remember people glazing over when I said the word and thinking, "I don't, I don't know what you're on about. What is this job?" So, what is a diocese, and what what do you do? What's your role? <laughs> so the diocese of Blackburn, um, a diocese is simply a collection of churches that are under the jurisdiction of a bishop. Um, so. The Church of England Diocese of Blackburn represents much of Lancashire, uh, so the towns of Blackpool and Blackpool and Burnley, of course, and the cities of Lancaster and Preston. Um, and you will all be familiar with Bishop Julian, who is our uh, diocesan bishop, and then we've got our suffragan bishops of Bishop Philip and Bishop Jill. So that is our diocese. And um, to give you a little bit of background, um, the diocese here in Blackburn was established in November 1926. So when you're hearing people talking about Vision 2026, it's because we're work, working towards the diocese celebrating a big birthday. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the diocese. Um, I came to work with the Board of Education in 2010. Uh, so I've been around a little while on the Board of Education. Um, and as I kind of touched on before, I started off in an administrative role in the Board of Education. But because I've got that children's work experience that I've done in a, in a volunteering role in church, um, and I'd also done a university certificate in children's ministry and um, my responsibilities kind of gradually increased um, and then in 2016 I was appointed as the under fires advisor uh, and then when the previous children's work advisor Susan Wicks was uh, retiring in 2018 I was invited to apply for the role um, and it was a horrible tough interview process um, but obviously I got the job so it all worked out well in the end so <laughs> what do I do? And um, my role is just so varied. Um, I think, sort of talking about it, and I think I, I forget all about what the role entails, but basically my remit uh, is children from 0 to 13 years old. Um, so there's a crossover with uh, Ben, who was a youth work advisor, who does uh, 11s and up. Um, and naturally, because my role is about working with children, um, then invariably I get to work with their families a little bit as well, particularly at the younger end. So in general, I support parishes with their children's work, and I do that by offering training, uh, creating lots of resources, um, supporting churches when they want to set up new initiatives, so toddler groups or messy churches and things like that. Um, I do work quite closely with Ben, the youth work advisor, uh, so we do some, uh, some events together. Uh, for example, we offer a diocesan youth camp, which is a residential weekend uh, for young people in school years six to nine, which Kat will remember well, because that used to be one of her, um, one of her events. Um, yeah, and we yeah, do other things. Cancelled this year, but I'm looking forward to next year. <laughs> yeah, so not cancelled, we've teleported. Kat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, we do other events. So we've been doing some prayer and worship nights where we've invited people across the diocese to gather together to pray for the work of children and people because everything that we, we do and we're trying to do needs to be underpinned by that prayer. Um, I do a children's ministry conference for the diocese which uh, takes place each year in the spring so that's kind of my um, kind of flagship event really if you like and then sometimes if I'm lucky I get to go into schools and lead collective worship and do praise parties and things and do other bits and pieces that supports the wider work of the Board of Education. So like I said, it's very broad and there's lots of different things involved and no two days are ever the same, mm -hmm. um, which keeps it really exciting and, and fresh and challenging really. But yeah, I love it. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's a good team to work with as well, isn't it? I'd, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd my time working with <laughs> so uh, we've uh, come into some more questions that we've had sent in now. And some of these have been a bit about like sharing our faith and how we might share faith with children specifically. So one of the questions is, in what ways outside of church schools, because we talk quite a lot about church schools and we know about church schools. So what ways outside of that do you think church can connect with children who've never had any involvement in um, in church or any connection with church? So some people have, have had a bit and drifted away or their families bring them along. But specifically, this question is about those who've not had any contact, really. Yeah. And obviously that's, um, that's a, a, a big concern, isn't it, at the minute, because um, Scripture Union, who I've done some research on this recently, they estimate that 95% of under-18s don't go to church, which of course 
and as you've just acknowledged here, that question, that presents a massive challenge for us because we want to spread that good news of Jesus um, with, with all ages, but especially that younger generation. And um, I think probably the first thing that I would suggest that people do, um, because there's no kind of one size fits all model that I can suggest to people that works for every parish, is, is to have a look at your community profile. So where are the children that you're trying to reach? Are they at home on their Xboxes? Are they out on the football field? I'm talking about normal day to day life here, by the way. <laughs> are they out on the football pitch? <laughs> um, are they playing football on a Sunday morning? Uh, do they go to you know, martial arts clubs or dancing? Or where are they? Where are they spending the majority of their time? So that you can then think about how you can connect with them. Um, so, for example, you know, if you feel that there's a huge portion of children that aren't connected to your church uh, who are involved in sports, uh, then maybe it's then might prompt you to look at some kind of sports ministry, which is something that we're looking at as a wider diocese uh, as an initiative going forward over the next few years anyway. Um, so, you know, for example, there's lots of things like Ambassadors Football. Um, there's uh, another one down in London that I forget the name of that does like a sports football dance ministry. So if you've got children and people doing those things, perhaps there's a way that you can engage with those existing hobbies so that you can connect with children and young people where they are rather than expecting them always to come to us and come to our doors. Um, so, yeah, so thinking about what you can offer to connect with them really. I think another really good thing to think about is how you can match the skills of the people in your church with the needs of your community. Mm. One example is um, a, a church that I was working with recently, um, they wanted to encourage families into church uh, and uh, they found that some parents were struggling for after school care. So the church started offering uh, just once a week um, a, a singing group uh, because they had somebody in church who loved singing and you know was in a position to be able to do that with children so they started offering this singing group and they've created this kids choir that now comes to church once a month and sings and of course their families come with them and um, so that's what they did they, they had somebody that had the skills to sing and that need of some kind of after school care so those things came together to, to create that and like i said that won't be the same for, for every church because the, the skills of the congregation and and the people at church will be different and the needs of the community will be different but just thinking about how you can match the needs with the skills is a, is a good place to start. Um, another good good um, thing to think about is often churches will have um, children in church kind of up to year six age and then connecting with them as they move on to high school can be a problem. Mm. Um, so I would encourage you to think about how you continue to have that relationship with year six leavers. So potentially inviting them to something at church just like a reunion type thing in the September after they've all gone off to high school where you can just get them together and share some food and, and have that as a kind of reunion so they've got a purpose for coming back together and then you can start a discussion about how you could continue gathering that group of young people um, and although you've asked the question saying outside of school it could be that you use your relationship with school as a starting point to think about what you might offer. Um, so perhaps chatting with parents in the playground to what kind of things they might come along to um, and talking to, to the school to see if there's anything that you can link in with but that, that then allow you to grow a relationship with it. And just going back to the scripture union thing, um, you know, the, the 95 campaign where they are on a mission to outreach to all these children and young people who um, aren't currently connected to a, a church community. There's loads of great material and resources on their website that you can have a look at. And um, I met with Rob, their regional um, manager, not so long ago, and there's things that they are willing to come and support you in. If you wanted to do like a, a mini mission event that was in your community, um, they've done things like, um, you know, giving out sweets and uh, fish sandwiches, I think it was on one occasion. <laughs> thousand I think so they did two oh, sandwiches um, uh, but there's loads of things that they can support you with and they'll, they'll come along and physically send people from Church Union to be there with you to help do these kind of mini missions um, to try and make connections with those people and, and kind of grow um, grow some, some kind of connection with those children and young people that aren't currently in church. Brilliant there's loads of really really good ideas there and I, I really like 
that kind of place where you started just to look at the community and, and find a bit of a point of connection of where some of the young people might be at and what, what they're doing. But also, like, like you say, everyone's got different people in their congregation. I discovered uh, recently that a couple of people in our congregation um, do like 1940s reenactment kind of uh, so know all the dancers and, and have got like outfits and stuff and I just suddenly thought how cool would that be for um, kids who are learning about uh, those times and things and, and that again there might be a bridge there so there's yeah amazing you know, people are into all sorts of different things aren't they and um, often that that's not something we necessarily think oh yeah we can bring that into church but sometimes there's creative ways we can so yeah absolutely one of the other questions we had that was similar was um, how can we encourage families in our community to try church and not feel nervous um, or put off about coming in? I'm, I'm going to skip that one for a minute because you've given quite a lot of good ideas. I think that um, like already answer that um, and we've got quite a lot of questions, but hopefully the person who sent that in will think that's been covered a little bit by some of the things you've said. Maybe come back to it at the end of the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for children themselves, um, like having a Christian faith can sometimes well it can be challenging for kids sometimes they, they might um perhaps feel very different to their friends and one of the questions we've had is about peer pressure and and um, the person who sent in says uh, often being a christian is seen as uncool uh, how can kids have confidence in their faith and still be cool with their mates it's really hard isn't it peer pressure in general is really really hard and i think um we need to remember that, that, that children and young people can experience peer, peer pressure on a number of fronts. So, for example, I remember when I was kind of a teenager um, and I had a friend who was, was quite a good friend and we went shopping into town um, and on a whim she kind of picked up a, I think it was like an eyeliner or something from the shelf in the, in the chemist in, in, the, in, the, in town, put it in a pocket. And I remember at the time feeling really uncomfortable um, and kind of stuck between wanting to say something to her and call her out saying actually this is not acceptable um but at the same time kind of feeling pressured that you to kind of go along with that behavior knowing that it wasn't right and not what what you agreed with um but like i said peer pressure in general general is really really hard because you know children want their friends to to like them and think well of them so it can be really hard for children and young people to be bold enough to say that they've got a christian faith um i think probably i'd look at some bible teaching um, which would remind children and young people that as Christians we're called to stand out and actually being different because we have a faith is okay um, and that means following God first and not being tempted to follow our friends and there's lots of Bible passages that we can we can talk about there we can talk about Jesus being tempted in the desert and um, also the um, Romans 12 verse 2 says do not conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so I think there's little things that we can do there in terms of teaching and Bible study that would um, encourage our children and young people um, and just show them that it is okay um, to stand out because we've got that Christian faith. I think another thing is making sure um, that our children and young people know that they're not alone um, so that, that they don't feel like they're the only person that has this faith and feel that they have to, to kind of hide away behind that. So hopefully they're already in a position where they've got connections with other people who are Christians, whether that's through church groups or youth groups or whatever, or maybe there's some kind of, I don't know, sometimes there's lunchtime clubs and things that happen in schools. Um, but if not, then it can be helpful for us um, as, as people who are discipling those children to try and encourage some kind of support network for them so that they can feel that they're not alone. Um, so this can be done through kind of groups in school. Uh, there's like ethos councils and other things going on, like I say, or through church groups. But maybe um, if you've got a young person or a child who's kind of on their own in that age bracket, that can be difficult, can't it? So we perhaps need to get a little bit creative maybe have a conversation with parents or with teachers at school to try and make sure um, that there's a kind of appropriate friends to link those people up with. And then maybe in terms of youth group, if you've got like a, a lone young person, um, is there another local church that's got a thriving youth group that they could attend? And that's not about other that other church healing your, your young person, but just making links so that, that that young person can then connect up with other Christians and, and feel like they're not that like lone ranger really. Um, and then there's things like I mentioned briefly the youth camp that we do and um, residential events like that can be really helpful because uh, young people can come along to that event and meet Christians of their age from other churches and again it just gives them that sense that they're not alone in this Christian journey. Yeah. Um, the other thing my other, my other thought was when answering that question is 
being a Christian doesn't have to be uncool. And I know it sometimes is perceived as being uncool, but perhaps as churches, we might need to think about how we could make it cool. And um, so, you know, there's some really great kind of young Christian bands out there, maybe having some kind of music night where you've got like a worship band on. Maybe there's something like that you could do that would make it seem less uncool. Yeah. Um, and maybe then that would allow those two young people opportunity to invite friends along and, and give them a glimpse of what church looks like and actually that it isn't um, that kind of geeky, dull, boring thing, however they perceive it, that, that they think it is. Another thing just to mention at this point is, if this is something that parents are particularly concerned about, if they're concerned about their child um, because you know they're, they're feeling like they've kind of been singled out or under pressure from their friends because of their, their faith or their exploration of faith, then there's an organisation that comes under the heading of BRF, the Bible Reading Fellowship, which is called Parenting for Faith. And they have some great stuff for parents, great stuff that uh, helps to support and equip parents to, to raise children that are connected to God. Uh, and they've got some stuff on there that helps um, kind of navigate the whole peer pressure thing. So it'd be worth having a look at those resources. Brilliant. That's, that's really helpful. And I, I think what you were saying about meeting up with other Christians it is really helpful. I remember being kind of a, a teenager and me and my brother were the only two young people in our church. And then my godmum lived across town and went to a different church and said, oh, we've got a youth group. Do you want to go? And for me, that I think that like saved my faith at that time because it meant through my teenage years, I had this group that I could connect with and we could talk mm. about um, what it's like at school and all those kind of things. It, it made a massive difference. You, you kind of mentioned at the end there, um, parenting children of faith, um, but we've got a really good uh, question sent in that is, how do we support young people who are perhaps interested in attending Sunday school or church, or they want to learn about Christianity, perhaps they've heard bits at school or whatever, but their views aren't supported by their families? Yeah, that's a really difficult one, isn't it? Um, I guess practically it depends on whether the young person is old enough to attend church on their own or not. So I don't know whether we know the answer to, to the, that in this instance. I mean, if they're not old enough to attend church on their own without their family, and I think it's really important that somebody from the church tries to engage with that family in some way uh, to see if you can agree a way for that young person to be able to attend church. Um, perhaps the parents might be willing um, to let their child explore faith if you're able to have that kind of open discussion with them um, and they might be willing to compromise in terms of bringing them to church say once a month if they can kind of agree to some kind of compromise that would give them access to come if perhaps that's not a possibility or they're not willing to do that then maybe you could discuss with parents whether they could en enlist the help of a friend's parents who attends church uh, to bring their child so that there's that kind of responsible adult bringing their child who who wants to come along. But then if neither of those are possible, um, then you might need to explore whether the parents would consent to their child coming to church without them being present. Um, and of course, you need some kind of written consent agreement there, um, including sorting out the practicalities of how that child would get to and from church. And I think it'd definitely be worth seeking some advice uh, from uh, Sharon, who's our diocesan and safeguarding officer, if that became necessary to go down that route. So. I guess that's like the, the, the practical side of it. Um, in terms of, of kind of nurturing um, and, and growing that young person spiritually, um, I think definitely you need to, to really have people at church maybe who can take that person under their wing, mm -hmm. um, whether that's a children's work leader or members of the congregation, um, just to make sure that there are um, kind of Christians in church who are taking an interest in that person and praying for them uh, and just so that that person has some kind of points of contact really who they know, know they can go to yeah. to ask those questions that they might ask at home um, I know that some churches do like a quite a successful thing where uh, they match up uh, young people in church with older members of the congregation to kind of create like a, a grandparent type relationship mm -hmm. um, and just knowing that those those more mature Christians are praying um, for the children has been really successful in kind of nurturing faith. So particularly where parents aren't supportive, um, then that's definitely something that we explored. And then I think the other thing would be uh, potentially looking at resources and things that you can help um, either give to or, or signpost if it's like electronic apps and things. And um, just so that, you know, if parents are home aren't supportive, 
um, you can kind of supply that young person with, with materials to help them with Bible study um, and, and kind of just so that they feel that they've got places to go for information really. Yeah. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, and you've actually kind of headed towards one of our other questions, which is around kind of resources, um, apps, websites, games and things, specifically online. Someone said that, that they've got like good books like the Action Bible and, and um, 40 New Testament mini Bible stories, like lots of good resources, but what specifically is online that's out there, apps and, and things that you might recommend? Oh, so in terms of the online stuff, um, there's not loads and loads actually, which is, is disappointing, but I think currently, because of the current situation, it's definitely a growing area of resource um, because, you know, the circumstances that we found ourselves in at the minute has prompted everybody to wake up uh, and embrace uh, a more digitally supported ministry. Um, so a few bits and pieces that I can flag up in terms of digital resource. Um, Scripture Union have produced a game called Guardians of Ancora. Um, which is, I'm not, I'm not particularly into gaming, but it, I think it's like a, you're a character and you, you walk through the, the world um, and there's like challenges to do which uh, require you to uh, read Bible scripture and things. So there's that game, which I believe is really, really good and there's lots of supporting materials on the Scripture Union website and that game's free, which is great. Um, the Christian Broadcasting Network, uh, I've got some material called Superbook Kids. Uh, so there's apps and games that go with that material as well as like videos and things. So they've got quite a good uh, website of growing materials there. Um, lots of us uh, adults will be familiar with Top Trumps. Um, we've got, I don't know, Star Wars Top Trumps and Harry Potter Top Trumps and all sorts. But there is a Bible version of, of Top Trumps now. Uh, I think there's like an Old Testament and a New Testament set. But there's also an app of that. So you can download the app of Bible Trumps and play that for free. So there's things like that. And then going a bit more high tech, which I had to Google, um, I'm admitting now, I had to Google what these meant. So missional generation, I've got some um, AR, which is augmented reality, and VR, which is virtual reality. That's what I had to Google. Um, children's apps that you can download. Um, to play some of them, you need to purchase back this headset thing, but it's only five pounds from their website, so it's not hugely expensive. Um, and then missional generation, again, I've also produced some um, stuff for thy kingdom come which is coming up at the end of the month including um, a digital family prayer map and you print off the map and then you use the phone oh do you know all about this i've got one just here oh, no, she got it you can use your phone to create this interactive virtual reality experience which sounds really cool um oh, there's the map we just ordered some for our god kids and we tried it out last night you you get these through the post they're really inexpensive and then you like hold the phone over it and you can play games and stuff it's good fun. <laughs> well, the stuff that's really exciting. So there's all sorts of stuff that's out there that's kind of growing. And then just a few bits um, that we are producing from uh, the Board of Education. So we have recently produced um, a podcast series, uh, which is for adults to do with primary school age children, which is called Bible Padlets. There's 10 episodes in the series. And the first series looks at um, Bible transformers, so people in the Bible who were transformed by Jesus. Um, they each episode is about 20 minutes long, but then um, there's there's a, a bit of a game at the beginning, and the story is presented as like a news report, uh, which you'll laugh at some of the ridiculous voices that the characters put on. <laughs> um, and then there's some discussion. So during the discussion, there's an opportunity to pause the podcast, and and the adults and the children can talk about what they've heard together and discuss what, what they think. And then uh, we we kind of close with a bit of fun, another game. Um, which you can then play at home. So there's things like that out there as well. So the, the Publix has been really successful. Um, we are writing a second series. So um, yeah, lots of things and, and other stuff that the Board of Education is producing that, that, you, can, that you can have. Right. Um, have you got, you've mentioned quite a lot of like different websites and stuff. Have you got like a list of those you could maybe send me? Mm. And then I'll, what I'll do is um, underneath this video in the comments, I'll, I'll put those in there and then people... Yeah they're kind of watching it and they think oh what, what, what was that one she said then yeah we're able to find the link and, and click and go on the website and i'll put the link to the board of ed website and things as well um, yeah, that'd be great. yeah lots of really really uh, interesting sounding resources there so it is almost half past and i think we've crammed loads of brilliant things in there i'm really sorry if you've sent a question in and we've not got to it but um i think some of the things that we have said have perhaps covered some of the other questions about 
uh, resources and resources specifically in lockdown a lot of those digital ones you were talking about would be relevant for that um so as we kind of come to a close there i just want to say a massive thank you but also ask if you'd be happy to lead us in prayer um, yeah absolutely so pat kind of primed me uh, that you usually end with a prayer um, so what I thought I would do, would do something a little bit practical that you could maybe um, replicate in your homes uh, and maybe at church at some point. Um, so thinking that uh, the Bible verse for this Sunday coming um, talks about how we should obey God um, and it kind of loosely links to um, that commandment that Jesus gave to us which was about loving one another uh, as he has loved us and how God loves us. So I have here piece of paper I've written God's love on it and I'm going to use this as a tool um, for our prayer um, hopefully I can juggle making sure you can see what I'm doing as well as, as praying at the same time so we'll see how this goes this is a, an experiment so um, I'm going to cut off um, one of the corners I'm of... just to put your full screen Sarah because I think this might help <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? But so I've cut off one of the corners um, of my piece of paper that says God's love because the interesting thing about God's love is um, if we count the corners originally, the piece of paper had plus four corners. Um, but if I give away one of the corners of God's love, um, which has now become three corners, my original piece of paper that says God's love has now got an extra corner. Um, and I think this is a really good illustration that the more of God's love that we give away and the more of God's love that we share with other people, um, then the more we end up with ourselves. Um, so as we pray, I'm going to cut off the corners um, and we're going to pray for our church families, we're going to pray for the local community, our diocese as a whole and our country, and I'm going to cut off uh, a corner of the piece of paper as we pray for each of those things, um, just to symbolise uh, God's love being shared across those places, but also uh, that that reaps more for more blessings for us as well so let's pray mm. heavenly father uh, we just pray now uh, for our church families and we pray for those connections uh, that we already have within our parishes and we pray especially for um continued relationships and continued discipleships as we navigate these times um where we aren't able to meet face to face so just show us the way, Father. And we just pray that you um, guide us so that we can make best use of this unusual circumstance. So we pray for our church families. And I'm going to cut the next corner. And here we are going to pray for our local community. We're going to pray for those people who are currently connected to us. We pray that those people are uplifted during this difficult time. Um, we pray that maybe they are seeking you and we pray that they will come to us and we can welcome them because we are able to connect with them in some way. And we just pray that those people who are struggling are able to find the help that they need, whether that's through um, the amazing work that's done through food banks and the other ways in which uh, churches and other groups are supporting these communities. So we pray for our local communities. And I'm going to cut the next corner. And we pray now for our diocese. We give thanks for the work of the diocese as a whole. And we just pray that our churches can work together and are strengthened during this time. I pray that churches are able to um, use digital technology in new ways so that they are able to continue to meet with their congregations. So we pray for our diocese. And finally, I'm going to put the last corner. And we pray now for our country. We pray for leadership um, we pray that good decision decisions are made um, so that we can uh, continue to find a way forward um, and especially we pray for our NHS who are 
playing such an important role um, in, in caring for people and fighting this fight. We just pray um, that science and um, medical teams are able to find new ways to keep people well and heal people who are not. So we pray for our country. And finally, we just finished by praying for ourselves and we are reminded um, that the more of your love that we show to others, um, the more blessings and the more of your love that we receive for ourselves. So we thank you for that now. And we pray all these things in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. I love that. And uh, yeah, really useful, simple idea that we can uh, use to pray ourselves as well. Um, so thank you so, so much. Um, it's been fantastic to have you on Wednesday Q&A. And um, yeah, we'll get some the links to the resources shared on there and, and people can find out a little bit more. And um, children's work is one of the things we're looking to um, develop even more here in Burnley. So um, some of those ideas that you've just shared, hopefully we can put into practice. Yeah, and if there's, if there's any questions that I haven't answered, if you want to, um, you can post them somehow and I could maybe respond. Um, yep. Type in a response if that would be helpful. I don't mind doing Yeah, that. brilliant. <laughs> Great, I'll, I'll tag you in the video and then um, yeah. uh, we can we can keep the dialogue going a little bit because mm. I know some folks are watching from Burnley and some from a little bit further afield as well. So if you are in Burnley and you're part of St Matthews and you want to get more involved in uh, children's work, then please uh, do chat to Father Alex or myself. It'd be great to um, chat to you a bit more about that. So thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you everybody for watching. And um, we are going to uh, stop the stream there, but we'll carry the conversation on. So. Um, Bye everybody and we'll see you um, uh, probably a little bit later. Father Alex will be on for evening prayer. So, <laughs> all right, thanks.